Okay, here we go. Hello, everyone. AP Canavan and I are back for another discussion of the Malazan Book of the Fallen. And today we are talking about Memories of Ice. This is book three. Oh, look at your cover. Oh, nice. Okay. I actually like my cover better this time. Okay, well, are we playing this game again? <laughs> oh boy, here we go. I actually just wanted to see that. That is why I said that. Ooh. Um, Ooh. Okay. <laughs> and then hang on a sec. I'll, well, you, you carry on doing your intro there, Philip. Okay. Oh, yeah. Give me a, show me a nice, you know, I, I just said that. So you would pull that out. You know that, right? <laughs> So uh, yes, we are here to talk Memories of Ice. And as usual, we are gonna do a spoiler-free discussion. And that is appearing here on my channel. And we are gonna follow that up with a spoiler-filled discussion on Memories of Ice. And that is going to appear on AP's channel, A Critical Dragon. So the spoiler-free here and the spoiler talk will be on AP's channel. Have you found the illustration yet? Yeah, but I, hang on a sec. Warn everyone that technically what you're about to see may be considered a spoiler. Ah, so, so okay. So skip, skip uh, 10 seconds. Okay, you're about to see an illustration that could be interpreted as a spoiler, so. Actually, just just close your, close your eyes if you don't want to see. Close your eyes, right, right. Philip, close Philip. Your, ooh. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, that is just awesome. Okay. That's what uh, those look like. Ooh. Uh, so the, the illustration has gone. The illustration has gone. There's no spoiler. No spoiler. Yes, you, can, you, can, you can look now. <laughs> That's brilliant. I envy you those, AP, very much. And I know I'm not allowed to ever touch them, but at least I can see them on the screen. So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, boy, just for the... Non-spoiler stuff, just to begin, I have to tell you, AP, last night I was finishing this book and I always read lying down in my bed. So I'm lying down in my bed and for some reason, the words on the page started getting blurry as I was getting to the end of this thing. And I must have made a distinctly unmacho, uh, shuddering noise because my wife turned to me and she asked me, are you laughing or crying? And I, <laughs> I just barely managed to get out one word, which was both. So yeah, <laughs> it was uh, just an incredible ride. This this uh, this guy, he he can Stephen Erickson, man, uh, boy, he he can and tug at your heart and make you feel just incredibly fantastic simultaneously. So I don't know how you. And and this is one of those things that uh, it it becomes a hallmark of I think this series in particular that the heights of emotion yeah. that this that Erickson manages to make you as a reader engage with these characters so much that you actually care. It, it's as awesome as the battle sequences are, as, as brilliant as the action sequences are, as scary or as horrific as those sequences are, as amazing as the magical sequences are, it ultimately comes down to this is a story about these characters. And when you invest in that journey, and it's a lot of what we said about Dead House Gates as well, when yes. you invest in that journey, it is heart wrenching, but in the the best sort of cathartic way. Yes. Um, yep. Which and, is why I was I was laughing and crying. Really, <laughs> that, I couldn't tell you exactly what it was. But it was both. So. Um, and I would have to say it's it's one of those things that um, great literature has always been able to do for me. We spend so much of our time in real life being pent up. Of you know we're in public. Don't show emotion. Or well. I don't know about where you grew up, but where I grew up, oh, yeah. it's don't don't be showing emotion. And um, we learn that as a, a quite an unhealthy behavior that you know you pent you you pen these emotions up inside, you you force them all down. And literature, for me at least, has always been this way to release that. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell um, you, we, we New Englanders, we have mastered the art of repression. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a place where we can 
uh, more than maybe in our actual daily lives, uh, feel the cathartic release that probably we 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 could use uh, a little more in in real life as well. So yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And of course, one of the terms that we use in in literature is sublime, and it's it's yeah. used in literature in a very specific meaning, which it doesn't always translate to the real world, and it's the highest emotion that the mind is capable of. And yeah. Yeah. You know, when, when people hear, I remember when undergraduates heard that for the first time, they're like, but that, that the mind doesn't feel emotion. And you go, no, no, but this is sublime. It is something, it's about both the mind and the, the sense of soul, the, the spirit, the feeling. Yeah, beautiful and, word, beautiful word. And so appropriate for this series. And it is maybe the highest praise you could give in, in literary terms. Uh, so beautifully said. Um. So that's I, I think the sublime is something that I that I genuinely think about when reading Erickson stuff, um, because the the blending of incredibly good writing and I, I people say, oh, it's good writing or bad writing uh, when they mean I liked it or I didn't like it. I'm talking about good writing on a technical level. Yes. The yes. complexity of language, what it can convey, the depth of meaning with with so many taking one passage and in that passage you go another author might have needed three paragraphs to convey exactly the same information that's yeah. that is a skill and a talent that um everyone should be able to recognize and respect yeah. and in combination with this the creation of these characters that stick to your heart and they claw you their way in and yeah. even then characters who we want to despise who we want to hate and we want to look at them as a two-dimensional villain that oh it's just evil for evil's sake yeah and we get these glimpses into what they went through to make them that way yep and erickson is always at pains to never excuse their behavior but right. in showing us these things he goes understand their behavior not excuse it. That's a very different thing. Right. But look at look at what they became. They're, they weren't born that way. Right. Right. Um, yeah, and I that, think that backstory is, is so important. And we've talked about it before with, you know, for example, Adjunct Lorne in Gardens of the Moon. But the characters in here, the atrocities they commit are just such on, on a totally different scale almost. And yet, Erickson still has us by the end unable to uh, maintain the anger and and uh, suddenly you just you you feel this sense of oh oh and oh wow that's where that was coming from all that pain all that suffering as you say we're not condoning the action but we are understanding in a way that just leaps out of the pages and and grabs your heart it's it's great stuff and certainly like, one of the, the fascinating things I think about, and we see it very explicitly in Memories of Ice, um, but it's, are people on the other side, are they opponents? Hmm. Are they adversaries? Or are they enemies? And one of the things that, that I think Erickson does very well in these books is he makes a very clear distinction between an enemy mm -hmm and what uh, an opponent or adversary could be. And I think all of us in today's world, in when we see arguments online, uh, arguments on social media, when we see reportage in, in the news, when we see politics being discussed, yep. quite often we, we, we see this element of, if you don't agree with me, you are my enemy. Right instead of saying no we may be on different sides but that is not what an enemy necessarily is that's right. not what a villain is that's right. that could be quite a different thing and i think these books uh there's a significant chunk particularly of this one is about that very aspect i agree and even among the allies you have an important alliance here there are moments of mistrust and you have to negotiate so even the people you supposedly agree with you know you're not always going to see eye to eye 
And so there is some nice negotiation going on in terms of keeping the alliance that is here together as well. Of course, we're not going to get into specifics here, but uh, we can talk about them later. That's a great theme that you see throughout the books, though, what you're talking about. And there are quite a few uh, just <laughs> powerful themes. And that's another thing I think that you and I agree about these this series is the ability to blend an entertaining, just uh, you know, amazing story that grabs all sorts of people. Blending that with these themes like motherhood in here is a huge theme or the, the nature of memories and the impact of memories. And you know, there's sacrifice and atonement. And we're obviously gonna talk about all these individually, but there's redemption, there's turning horror and pain and suffering into grief and ultimately compassion. There's, you know, uh, the, there's the nature of compassion, you know, how it must be free. One of the best quotes, I think, from the entire series appears in this book, um, and it's about the nature of compassion and how it must be freely given without expectation. Uh, so there's just all this stuff is in here with two, in a way, two prologues in a way that are very important to pay attention to. We have to say that you better pay attention to the, the prologue. Very important. And then two major conflicts. So lots of stuff to talk about in this one. Yeah. And uh, anyone who, who ever, you know, has the misfortune to wander into my channel, I've made it a habit now where I will do a breakdown video very specifically of the prologue. So uh, I will do one of those once, you know, we, we've had this chat out of the way. I haven't awesome. done it yet. You might have to make at least two videos, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think. Because you've got the one part that's 300,000 years before and the other that's 100,000 years before. And they're both important, right? What's, so. what's 200,000 years between friends? <laughs> Especially in the Malazan world. Yeah. Um, so. so I I know that uh, some, some readers, when they're going through, you know, they liked Gardens of the Moon or they had issues with Gardens of the Moon. And they found that Dead House Gates was very much a disconnect. Um, that they found that it was it was too different because it was a lot of different characters. Yeah. Um, but a, a lot of people I think will find this a more conventional sequel to Gardens of the Moon. Yeah. Um one of the other series that actually did something very similar to this was Raymond D. Feist's uh Rift War, where yeah. he started out. Now I know in the States it was published as Magician's Apprentice, Magician Master. In the UK, it was just published as Magician. Oh, because my edition just says Magician on it. So maybe um, I have the UK one. But. Well, it, I think it was originally published as two volumes, and then they just did, as bookbinding got better, they published it as a single volume. Okay, okay. Um, but it was followed up by Silverthorn, which, you know, it, it appeared to be a completely different story, and it was a, a different style. And mm. then they went back to Darkness at Sethanon, which sort of brought back a lot of the characters from the first book and had that more sort of conventional epic feel to it. Yeah. Um, I think this uh, Memories of Ice is very much like that in, in that sort of structure. Gardens of the Moon, we can look at Dead House Gates as sort of like Silverthorn, and then we're uh -huh. going back to Darkness at Sethanon. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. And of course, it's not only because we have a continuation of some of the characters we were with in Gardens of the Moon in Memories of Ice. These are familiar faces. Obviously, maybe that's helpful to a lot of readers. They've already felt some connection to these characters. So that's great. That might make it a little bit easier. And But I also think there, there's something about this book that makes it, um, you know, we've always talked about how Erickson and Esselmont both are uh, not necessarily going to conform to those tropes. And that is certainly the case here in Memories of Ice. There's a lot of trope busting going on. So you have to get used to that. And the fact that there are, in a way, you could say, maybe we can talk about this more when we do the spoiler discussion, but it's a point that's worth talking about. Are there two climaxes, in a way, in this book? Or how are they connected? So that's something to talk about more specifically later. I don't know if you have any general thoughts on that now. Um, well, I, I think for, for readers who want something that has the feel, uh, and by the way, when I say conventional, this is not pejorative. This is right. not uh, in right. any way 
sort of going, oh, well, the other books were all this and, and this is just, con yeah. I'm talking about conventional in, in this will meet uh, reader expectation more readily than yeah. I think either of the first two books did huh. because there are certain things uh, if we think of the structure of Gardens of the Moon, right. that with the big battle at the very start and then a right. different type of climax, yeah. that subverts a certain expectation because it's almost an inversion of what you expect. Right. With Dead House Gates, the way that novel is divided up and, and how we focus on those different elements, again, is not the expectation that we have. Right, right. But I think with Memories of Ice, there is a more conventional approach to that particular aspect. Uh -huh. So because the structure is in some ways much more similar, readers can feel a lot more comfortable with it. And therefore it can be different in different in, in other elements. Yeah. And that will not be as jarring or create the same sort of level of cognitive dissonance. Right, right. Does, does that make sense to you? It does. I, I'm, I'm with you there. And at the same time, uh, you can expect the unexpected in in this book <laughs> <laughs> well, to put it mildly yeah well to be to be perfectly frank in gardens of the moon um when we were introduced to uh to onos tulan he right. bursts out of the ground unexpectedly and spears someone with a stone sword yeah if you as a reader are not expecting ericsson to do strange and weird and wacky things or yeah. for things to come out that will just shock you or challenge your expectations yeah what series have you been reading <laughs> yeah and there are some really uh, new elements in here too by the way we should have said earlier i should have said earlier there could be spoilers for gardens of the moon obviously and dead house gates in this you know even this non-spoiler well, discussion for memories of ice um so and that was we'll, not really we'll put that in the put that in the description <laughs> Yeah, I'll put it in the Sorry. description. Yeah, we'll be good. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are there are some there's some stuff that you could say comes in a very like out of left field, almost kind of like the Bocalane and Corbel Brooch parts of here, which we'll talk about more specifically later. I love these things. You know, there's some great um, comedic aspects to this. I mean, it's yes, I mean, the obvious thing to talk about here is the tragedy and the pathos and all of that, but it is relieved by these comedic moments that are just, I think, just put in there right in the right place in order to give the reader some uh, relief from these, you know, really tough narrative moments. And so I love that, that we have these unpredictable and sometimes, I mean, you've got the, um, what is the Mott Irregulars, right? I mean, I'm not sure I figured out these guys yet, um, but um, they're, they're kind of fun. And I'm, I'm glad they're there because, and, and it has that feel too of this world that uh, Erickson and Esselmont, and you talked to Ian Esselmont uh, very recently about this, creating this world. And I, I get the feeling that, you know, obviously when you, you do it with this, this gaming, you're throwing in all kinds of fun stuff randomly at the moment. And that's where these things come from, right? <laughs> And well, as as uh, as Ethelmont said in that interview, when they were gaming, obviously they were they were gaming with each other for each other, so they could be as over the top and as exaggerated as they wanted to be. Yeah, because that was their audience. Right. But as soon as they started writing a narrative for other people to consume, right, a lot of those things had to change. And I think people who look at the the Malazan world and the stories in the Malazan universe and they go, oh, well, this is just, someone's just written up their campaign. I, I would challenge you to, to look at the narratives created here and yeah. compare them to uh, Weiss and Hickman's Dragonlance Chronicles, hmm. uh, because there is a very clear distinction between what Ericsson and Esamont have done, where they took inspiration from a gaming world and from gaming narratives and quite often extrapolated into the future or went, well, the quest ended here. Now, 15 years later, what has happened? That's where I'm starting my story. As opposed to what, what Weiss and Hickman did when they were developing Dragonlance as a game, yeah. that they play tested it and then wrote up the narrative. Yeah. That's that there is, 
they adapted a lot of stuff from the games. The games were an inspiration. The games helped them develop the world. Yeah. But as you pointed out there, the elements of humor being added in to be kind. Okay, I'm not sure. Hi. Okay, yeah, go back just a second because you froze up just for a moment there. Um, like um, maybe 10 seconds. Um, you were, <laughs> <laughs> you were I'm, talking about I'm sorry. The, the point that I had made about the insertion of humor. Yeah, so uh, the, the use of humor as a, uh, a point at which high drama or high tragedy, it forms a counterpoint. It could be a palate cleanser yeah. for these different things. So rather than being a, a tonal shift that feels discordant, it is actually something to give the reader that moment of relief. Yes. And we see the same thing yeah. with issues of pacing. If someone wrote a book that was entirely from beginning to end without cessation, battle sequences, if everything is a high octane battle sequence, Right. then oh, no. not, nothing has a peak, nothing has a trough, and everything just becomes normal. Right. If you have highs, it's good to have lows. If you have okay. lows, it's good to have highs. If it's always sad, it's nice to have a, a happy counterpoint if it is. So it's all about these balancing things. And I think uh, Ericsson's humor and Esselmont's humor that they work into their stories, particularly the soldiers, we, we see this time and time again of people in dark situations and tragic situations yes. who are terrified and and then they crack the most brutal jokes in the world because yeah. it's either laugh or cry. Yeah, exactly. I love those picker and blend moments, especially in here. It's just beautiful stuff. And the, um, I mean, like you were saying, this is, this is a well-forged sword here, and it has a very sharp edge. Um, and it's, it's these elements are really beautifully blended in here. I think masterfully, actually, orchestrated. And to give you, as you were saying, the the poignant, sorrowful so moments of suffering are all that more poignant because of the counterpoints and the comedic moments are there because we need them and they help us appreciate the sorrowful moments even more so yeah it's it's like you say laugh and cry uh, and that's that's what you got to do that's what i was doing last night when my wife was making fun of me <laughs> so well, she was just being mean then yeah well actually she she, she was being gentle about it i guess so well guess. Do, what you should say is okay honey you read the book and I'm going to video your reaction. <laughs> Actually, I have to tell you, uh, my wife has started reading the series. She finished Gardens of the Moon and she is in Dead House Gates right now and she's loving it. So we are, we're, we're doing some good work here. You know, we're, we're getting some one, one person at a time. So all we need to do now is marry lots of people and make them all read. <laughs> there we go. That's the strategy. Huh? Well, maybe, maybe oh, not. Exactly. My wife overheard that. <laughs> so yeah, well, maybe we'll just stick to what we're doing. But um, so do we have any other um, non-spoiler points that we want a potential reader of Memories of Ice or the Malazan Book of the Fallen to know about before we stop this and talk about the spoilers? Um, I think reassuring people uh, and Again, like the, the information I am about to say is on the, the back. So yes. that I don't think that counts as a spoiler. But uh, going back to the, the continent of Ganabacus, seeing a lot of those characters again, yeah, a more, what feels like a much more consolidated uh, conventional narrative with uh, levels of the high adventure, high magic, as well as uh, impressive military feats, which we sort of, again, if you've read Gardens of the Moon, you're familiar with that. If you've read Dead House Gates, you'll be familiar with that. Yeah. Those elements are all here. We have, um, and I think everyone realizes that how deeply uh, Dead House Gates affected me emotionally. Yeah. I think 
this has a similar emotional punch, but in a in a slightly different area. Dead House Gates was very specific for me yeah. Um, yeah. in in those feelings, whereas this is more uh, connected very specifically to certain characters as opposed to big, very powerful themes in yeah. the same way I think they did in Dead House Gates. Other people may disagree. Um, yeah, yeah. But I... I think those things are all going to be there for if you liked Dead House Gates um, and how it made you feel, mm -hmm. Memories of Ice will do that. Yeah. If you like the more conventional story structure of Gardens of the Moon and those particular characters, yeah. Memories of Ice will do that as well. So yeah. it's, it's a nice sort of way that those two different books are now sort of coming together into one, uh, one volume. On top of that, I think you have, if you're somebody who really loves military fantasy, you have two of the best described conflicts I think you could find just about anywhere. I mean, you have the Siege of Kapistan and you have later on Coral and uh, man, it's just- uh, you, you can't tell people the names of cities. Oh, I think that's okay. That's on the back, right? Yeah. No, no, it's not. <laughs> well, there's Leave some it. awfully awesome military fantasy in here. So I think that's, a, that, that's fair. I mean, I don't think they have to worry too much. Uh, we didn't give away much there. Just be prepared to be awed and be prepared for some just, I mean, you will have your socks knocked off by the, uh, the scale of this, the, the pathos of it and everything else just it doesn't get better. If, if, if uh, epic fantasy is your thing, I just don't see how you can top this. And, you know, uh, well, maybe later in the series, we will, we'll see. It's, yeah, we're only on book three, <laughs> there's yeah. more. Yeah, yeah, hard to believe. Uh, but yeah, it's, we're not even a third of the way through here. Yeah, yeah. So awesome. Anything else for our audience, the benefit of the uh, audience? Uh, no, I, th I think we've covered a lot of the uh, the general points and I wouldn't want to start discussing any of these any further because yeah. we run the risk even with hints yeah. that someone who doesn't want to be spoiled at all and I can completely understand that. So I don't want to even hint at things because right. it, it can ruin some people's reading experience. Yeah, yeah. We're going to be we're going to be cautious there. All right, good. So. Thanks everybody for tuning into our non-spoiler discussion of Memories of Ice. And please, uh, if uh, you've enjoyed this, don't forget to like the video. And also even more importantly, join us for our spoiler filled discussion if you've read Memories of Ice and you wanna hear us talk about the specifics to fill in a lot of the details of what we were just hinting about in a non-spoiler way uh for this video so thanks so much for joining us and, and we look forward to seeing you all sometime again soon